Hey everybody, I'm Sean Rosenstiel, author of The School of Intentional Living and host of Authorized, where authors go live to reveal their insights, stories, and best lessons from their most recent works. Thanks so much for watching today and enjoy this week's episode. So I'm so excited to have with me today, Joanna Denton, author of A Different Truth. Joanna, thanks for being with us here today. You're very welcome. And I'm excited to talk about your book. I actually just finished it about an hour ago. And you know this, I'm an avid reader. I read about a book a week and I was so impressed with how well written it was. So kudos. Thank you. That, that means a lot. Thank you so much. Yeah, you bet. It was one of those books where I took a, you know, like a flyby. I, I read through it cover to cover spent a few hours with it over the last, I'd say two weeks. And it's definitely one of those on my reread list. I'd like to go back. There's so much great, valuable content in it. There's so many journaling exercises and I just can't wait to kind of get back through it and go through it with a fine tooth comb and, and uh, get some additional value out of it. So awesome, awesome job. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So tell me a little bit about how it came to be. Well, to be perfectly honest, it was meant to be a PDF with a couple of bullet points that I would put as free content on my website. And you mentioned um, it in, in the yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it kind of, well, maybe to give a bit of background, I'm actually, a, I'm a lawyer by training and I'm a veteran of a 16 year career in tax. So I actually write by the kilo um, and the kind of PDF turned into lots of words, but maybe maybe to explain a little bit about where the story came from, I need to take a step back and to talk a little bit about that past experience and what happened next. So back in 2014, I was 16 years into this international tax career. I'd been working in the UK and I'd moved to Luxembourg and I went through my second burnout in five years. I had spent far too many months and years working ridiculously long hours and far too long believing that this was what life was meant to be like. If you're working mm. in corporate, it's meant to be hard. If it's easy, you're not doing it right. Yeah. And the universe had been kind of sending me these wake up calls for a number of years. And I'd been pressing the snooze button on those wake up calls for so long until I had this kind of life-changing final wallop around the head with a great big plank of wood type experience that said okay you really need to change your life and and I went about I went about doing that because what I realized was that I could end up with a heart attack or a stroke by the age of 45 you know it wasn't the doctor telling me that it was me knowing that this to be the truth so I started kind of unpacking the reasons that I had got there. And what I realized was that it's very easy to almost blame it on a culture in corporate life. Well, the culture's like that. Everyone works too hard. The culture's like that. But actually what I realized or what I remembered was I'm responsible for my own life and my own choices. And actually what I was doing was not making choices because I was believing that I didn't have a choice and because I believed I didn't have a choice but to do what was expected, but to work those hours because otherwise it would be selfish or unprofessional. The fact of not choosing was a choice of itself. And as soon as I started to realize that, then I could do something about it. And as soon as I started to realize that and talk to other people going through similar situations, I realized I wasn't on my own to kind of tell myself these stories about what was expected. And the more that I talked to others and, and thought about and kind of unpacked my own thing and the more I read of different authors, the more I realized that there was a story to tell. And so that's really, if you like, when I, I decided what, what is the best thing that I could be telling my clients. And then that PDF and those bullet points turned into 10,000 words, 25,000 words. And, and um, after I got over the initial irrational thought that if I could pump out a tax memo in three days of 20 pages, well, surely a 200 page book was the same as, ta as 10 tax memos. So what's the problem? It'll take me a month or maybe a month and a half. Once I got over that initial completely 
unreasonable expectation and I could just enjoy the writing process. Um, I started writing and, and the book came from my own recovery and my journey back from burnout and, and different things that I've learned along the way from reading and, and working in professional life. And there we go. That's awesome. I think this topic of burnout is top of mind right now for a lot of people. I think there's more and more awareness for what this burnout thing is. I mean, I hear about this buzzword now all the time, burnout, burnout. A lot of us are talking about it. I don't know if I've experienced it myself, but I think at certain times, especially this year, I've gotten close. Can you help us understand like some of the warning signals, some of the leading indicators sure. of when we might be moving towards that place of burnout? I mean, what does that look like? Well, I can tell you what it felt like. Um, it felt like I got to the stage where I was walking through molasses hmm. in a world that all the joy and all the color had been sucked out of it. I, um, I felt like I was putting on a constant facade of you've got to be the strong one. You're, you're one of the senior women in the team and, and you have your team members coming to you and saying, oh God, I've got so much on my plate and, and, you know, I, I stayed in the office till seven o'clock the last couple of nights and, and every part of my being would be screaming to myself, come back to me when you've had 10 years of spending long hours and we'll talk about being tired, but you've got to be, you've got to kind of put on that facade. So I think that, I think kind of the types of signs are that it's that constant fatigue. It's that losing all pleasure for what you're doing, that you've got that little kind of motivation and you're just, um, trying to get through the day. I mean, from a, from a medical perspective, um, there are, you know, there are checklists of a, a bunch of different, um, you know, a bunch of different criteria and things that you to look out for, which I, I don't have to hand, but it's that, it's that sort of thing. It's, it's, hmm. um, yeah, it's when you are taking on so much stuff, finding it very, very difficult to say no, when it just becomes that emptiness, um, that emptiness of just trying to get through the day. Yeah. So you mentioned a few of your inspirational role models and some of the thought leaders and authors you've tuned into throughout the book. But, it, it, you know, what would you say, what helped you the most? Like, did you read a book? Did you, you know, as far as your own discovery was concerned through this burnout and through recovering, as you mentioned, I like that term, recovering from it all. Uh, what was one of the you know big aha moments or breakthrough that you had along that journey? Um, I think that, I think there were a couple, um, in, in no particular order, I think around the beginning of 2014. So before this happened, as I was kind of coming into, you know, really kind of coming into it, I went on a leadership course, um, in Luxembourg and we, we went off, um, there were a number of us in the woods and cabins kind of doing a, a leadership thing. And during the first session there, we were shown Brene Brown's TED talk about letting go of perfectionism. And I remember watching and, and thinking, holy crap, it's only taken me 42 years for someone to tell me I don't need to be perfect. I mean, where the hell did that come from? So I remember watching that and then after afterwards just hoovering up everything that she wrote. And as, it, as a book would come out, um, I would, um, I would get it and I would just absorb it and 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 I just got so much out of the the practicalities of it and she's also as an author as a speaker she calls a spade a shovel I mean she she's completely direct and 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 tells it as it is including her own vulnerability and and her sure. difficulty with that and I remember having my I've had a rock star groupie moment with Brene Brown so she was she was going to speak at the Emerging Women Live conference in California in 2015. A lot of us have had that, Joanna. You're not alone. Oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> She's incredible. She, I, mean, she, I mean, she um she was going to speak there. So I I live in at the time I was in Luxembourg. Now I'm in the UK. So I travelled to the other side of the world to watch her speak. Yeah. And she was doing a book signing uh, afterwards, and I thought, okay, I'm going to go up, and I had my speech. I had my speech about how her TED talk had changed my life and how I would always be grateful to her. 
And instead I go up, I'm the second to last, and I get in front of her and I put my hands on the table in front of her and I go, oh my God, it's you, I'm so excited and you're coming to London and this is amazing and oh my God. So I had a complete embarrassment moment. You had a groupie um, moment, yeah. I had a complete groupie moment with her because again, this was a couple of years, you know, this was a, a few years later and, and I'd read so much about it and it really was that. Um, I redeemed myself a few months later when she came to London and I went up to, to her in the coffee break and I apologised profusely for having the complete meltdown. But yeah, so I think definitely Brene Brown was one of the one of the writers to start with that had that kind of that turnaround yeah. stuff because I think, until, I think until then, so I mean the you know the other the other life changing things came slightly after it, but until then, when it came to anything like self development, I felt it. Well, I knew that I could intellectualize anything. Give me a book and I could tick boxes. Um, but this idea of kind of self development and self discovery just felt really pink and fluffy and woo woo and. I'm an intellectual, I'm a lawyer, I'm a tax consultant, I have law degrees and qualifications, don't give me this rubbish. And I, it, she gave me a way into it in some ways, just by really, by really resonating. That's awesome. That's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So speaking of TED Talks, mm -hmm. I believe you gave a TED Talk not too long ago. Is that right? Uh, yes, TEDx. TEDx. Okay. Um, I gave two of them. Um, so one at the University of Brest, which is an engineering school in the north of France. So that was in French. And then the second one was wow. at the University of Surrey um, last March. So just over a year ago. Yes. Okay. So I haven't seen those. Were those along the same topics as A Different Truth? Yeah, very much so. So the, the, the French one was the power, of, the power of a Choice. And the English one was... Um, the what choice are you not making today so it's broadly speaking the same story that kind of opens the opens the book um but yeah so that was that was a an interesting experience in, in itself actually doing a tedx cool but yeah lots of fun yeah. that's awesome that's awesome so was the book out when you did the tedx or were you working on it no i was working on it so basically um the first time i'm so uh, I started writing it, I would say, around the beginning of 2018. And I worked on it for a number of months, went through a first editing process with a developmental editor, Erin, who was had a, the patience of a saint. And then, so around the September of that time, I had something solid-ish. Then I did the TEDx's within the next five months. And then I kind of went back to it and started tweaking it. Because I think really, um, from the perspective of the process of writing the book, I don't think I really knew what I wanted to write until I was writing it and I was coming to the end. And when I, when I was bringing everything together and then had the opportunities to do these speeches, that's where I got really concrete on this idea of choice and taking back control of your life by taking back control of your choices. Sure. Until, until then, I think it was you know, throw some words at a page, hope something sticks. So it'd be quite nice to have a book, but you know, it wasn't really, um, it didn't feel real or, or doable. And then I did the TEDx's and then I spent the next couple of months doing the final copy editing and designing the book and everything else. That's amazing. It's so, so did you start with a plan and an outline or did you just literally start to put some words on? Cause, cause I'm so, like I said, I read a lot. I, I, I feel like I have a good, eye for good writing and great writing. And I'm, like I said, I'm very impressed with how well organized it is. Okay. You've chunked it out well, as I would call it for lack of a better term, but it's just really dialed in. And it's very, I find it, I found it very potent. I want to go back through it again and I want to start doing some of those exercises. So did you have an outline, a plan, or did you just kind of fly by the seat of your pants? <laughs> I always find it terribly sweet when, when anyone asks me, did you have a plan? I'm like, have you met me? Do I look like someone who has a plan? Um, I, think, I think there were elements, there were um, a number of elements on the book came from blog posts that I'd already done. 
because I, by that stage I'd been uh, working as a public speaking coach for a, a number of years. I'd written articles around some of those aspects. And then there, so there were elements that were there. I think to be perfectly honest, I came up with the five pillars. So um, there's a pillar around thrive, which means looking after yourself. Rewire, so rewire out of the fear into the possibility. There's a pillar around community. Basically, you're not on your own to do this. You can ask for help. Then there's something about telling your story. And finally, about connecting around your work from the stage. So when I had those pillars, um, there were elements of just putting words down. I'm not a big fan of a blank piece of paper, but you give me something that's already been written and I can play around with it and work on it. What I did know was that I wanted it to be very tangible um, in terms of any exercises that I did. I wanted them to be something that you could just pick up and run with them. And that probably comes from, you know, the, the tax background and so far as when I would be advising clients, what we would have to do is take the tax advice out of a piece of legislation or guidance and into something very tangible and business-like that a client could, could run with. So when I was writing the book, I wanted to do the same kind of thing. It's like, I don't want to give you theory. I want to give you something that you can actually mm. use. Um, sure. So there was very much that tangibility. And I also wanted it to be story-based. Um, so there are there are a lot of stories of, of um, tears and um, messiness and their stories of things I discovered for myself like I didn't know I had an unconscious bias about girls with big hair right. until I was writing the book you know um, and that sort of thing and, and those those elements kind of coming out and then I found that there were chapters that were easier to write um, for example one of the most difficult chapters for me to write was the community one because this story of I have to work this out by myself, I can't ask for help because if I ask for help, that's a sign of weakness. I'm the only one that can do this. Everything relies on me. It's on my shoulders. Those, I think what I found was those were the stories that were the most ingrained. And um, therefore, I think that's probably why the, the, the chapter on community became the most difficult because that's, I think, I think as authors, we write about what we need to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's where those sort of elements were coming, were, were the most difficult to, to write in the end, because that's really where I needed to learn and solidify things. Sure. Yeah. So I, I think it was so easy for me to connect with this because your, your vulnerability and your authenticity, it's very attractive for obvious reasons. But I, I saw myself in you quite a bit throughout this book. So where do these stories come from? You know, like how do we, where do they come from? We think we have to do it all of, on our own. We have to be completely self-sufficient. We can't ask for help. It's a sign of weakness. Mm -hmm. There's so many of us like that. This is not uncommon. So where does all of this, where do all these truths as you call them, mm -hmm. right? Where does it come from? Well, I think if you to speak to a psychologist, it's I think, which I'm not obviously, but these stories come at least certainly my understanding, they come when we're just, when we're growing up, when we're a kid and we're trying to find our way in the world and what's our position in the family and what are the things that work for us to get attention or to um, get affection or be accepted. And so we kind of, we, we get these stories of just trying to get through life. And then there's certain stories that we learn when we're very young that we keep on going. Um, I have stories about needing to be the responsible one because I'm the oldest of the family. And and um, I have a story which, which is incredibly interesting that I ha I've had to unpack where when we, we were younger, mom and dad would always say to us, so long as we've done our best, they wouldn't, they couldn't expect more. So if we've done our best um, in our exams, even if we, if we weren't top of the class, we'd still done our best. But what I realized was that what I'd heard was that you've got to be the best. And I was very different to doing your best. So those sort of stories that you kind of, um, you, you come in and, and I was the A student. I was the you know, senior prefect at school. I was the complete nerd with big glasses and a very bad 1980s perm. 
And so you kind of get that aspect. Then you go and you do a couple of law degrees and you, you learn at law school that if you want to get the best positions, you've got to get the best grades. And when you get in there, then you've got to work hard to get the promotion. So these stories are kind of, these stories, they get reinforced over time. They get nuanced as you go along. And essentially then what happens is that they, um, they serve as the basis for our thoughts and interpretations in different situations. Sure. You know, um, I mean, and the thing is, this is a work in progress as well. I might've written a book about it, but not, not longer ago than a week and a half, I find myself confronted by these stories again. So I was, um, I was due to take a week off on holiday and I hadn't had a proper break in a year. And it was Friday and I find myself feeling in a funk of like, well, I'm supposed to be on holiday next week, but, and what I realized was, so my niece was coming to stay with my parents. So she's eight going on 18 and a half. Um, fine line between she will either be an international lawyer or the head of an international crime syndicate the days where the line is so fine you would not imagine but she was coming <laughs> to town staying with my parents and what I was really realizing was that I was realizing that on my holiday I just wanted to have time for myself mm. do things for me but then I was starting to feel guilty that I did I wasn't wanting to spend 24 7 with my niece and I was feeling guilty about saying to mom and dad you know what um, I want to do things for myself. I'll come over in the afternoon. And, and so I got myself in this complete mind warp of a feeling of guilt about the possibility of having holiday. And I find myself at a choice point. And what I was saying to myself is, you know what, Joe, why don't you just work through? Start the holiday, just pretend that you've got to keep on working. Then you don't have to have these conversations then you don't have to have anyone else think that you're selfish because you don't want to spend time. And I caught myself thinking that, and I thought to myself, catch yourself on. You've written a book about this. You had two burnouts in five years because you were convinced that it would be selfish to look after yourself. And here you are, um, however long after the books come out, however long after this, and you're still, you've still got those stories. And I was able to catch it and make a different choice. And what I did was I chose to let go of that guilt and I chose to do things for myself. And I sat down and I said, okay, well, if I wanted to go on holiday, what are the, what are the things that I must absolutely get done? And it was about two and a half things. It wasn't like I had a great big long list of things yeah. to do. And so I kind of did that. And then I started planning fun things. And I booked myself into a four or five star hotel in Belfast, five miles down the road for the Friday at the end of the week. And I invited my niece to come for a sleepover and have a movie um, so that I could really enjoy it. And we had a breakfast date with my nine-year-old neighbor as well. She came over and had breakfast with us. Cool. Um, and then I had a week of breakfast on the patio, reading my book, and then going and seeing my niece for a walk in the afternoon. But it was this kind of release of letting go of that guilt and choosing not to feel guilty and choosing to do things for myself. That is a kind of reinforcement that we, I mean, I'm sure you've had similar experience. It would be fabulous if we could watch one TED talk and we'd learn the, the secret to life. And from there on in, it's a walk in the park because that's it's so right. darn easy. Right. Hell, I mean, neither of us are going to be, you know, we're not, of course that's not, it, it's a work in progress. And I think that um, what I said I had to do with the book was kind of flag up some of these aspects so that it become it comes on your radar and yeah. you can make those choice points of, do I go down the, do I go down this way, which would be my normal pattern of canceling the holiday and saying I'm too busy or do I make a choice to go down that way and let go of the guilt and actually do things for myself? Sure. I love what you're saying about letting go of guilt. And I think only recently that reached my consciousness, my, my awareness. Like I, I'll, you know, have breakfast with my family. And when I leave, it's like this ordeal. And that's probably on me. But it's like I, I'm like dragging three kids as I walk to the door. You know, nobody wants dad to leave for work, but work's got to get done. 
And for a long time, you know, I drive a 10 minute commute, whatever it is. And I would have that guilt and it would actually, you know, when I came from that place, it would affect the first few hours of my day. And, you know, am I making the right choice? Should I be taking the morning off? Should I be putting in more time? And I've learned recently, like, okay, commit to the choice that you made. You know, it's like, I made a choice. I'm doing this. I'm off. And now my mindset and my, my head and everything I'm paying attention to, the state I'm coming from, my energy, everything needs to be focused on the next move or the next thing that I'm getting into versus carrying all that baggage with me, right? So I love what you're saying about letting go of guilt. That, that only in recent months has really been on my radar screen. And it's such a powerful just awareness tool that you can decide to let that go and move forward. And for me, I, what you talked about is the opposite. You're, you're doing, you know, self-preservation, self-care, you know, the, the things that you need to be doing. We all need to be doing that. I'm talking about actually going back to work. <laughs> so it's a little different. But same thing applies when I'm with my kids. It's like I'm physically there, but sometimes mentally I'm not present. And they know, right? Your, your niece knows if you're at breakfast with her, if your head is at work. Yeah. Um, yeah. So same thing, same rule applies on the other direction, like you're talking about, you know, when we make a choice to be present with someone, we need to be present both phys physically, but, but I would even say more importantly, mentally, because even if you're on the phone with somebody, you know, you can tell when they're not there. Yeah. Right. Um, so I love that. So out of these five pillars, mm -hmm. which one do you see as being the most difficult? I, I know which one is maybe the most difficult for me and I won't share that, but what do you see from the feedback you've received from the people you've worked with? I mean, which of those five pillars are the most, uh, which one is the most difficult to really work on? Um, I think that's a very interesting question. And I think that it depends on who's reading it. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so far as the choices that we make, we make them in our in the own context and the own environment that we live in. You know, I'm single. I have two cats, but they're they're generally you know quite pain free, and they're unless I'm on video conferences and they're coming across. But I, I don't have a lot of you know I, I don't have a mortgage to pay or things like that. So I have a lot of freedom in in some ways to make choices that maybe someone else in a different situation financially or family. Um, would have and I think I think that's the I think the crux in terms of what is difficult or easy comes down to the individual circumstances of different people um in terms of in terms of the people that I work with very often um it's around the fear of not being good enough because I work primarily with female corporate leaders um who've been working in a corporate environment for so long they're doing incredibly well on the face of it everyone thinks that they are very very successful but they've spent so long trying to fit into a box and to play the political game that they get to the point that there there's a lot of self-doubt and a lot of self-criticism coming up hmm. so for them perhaps one of the, the most difficult things is letting go of that fear letting go of the inner critic those aspects of believing that they're not good enough and I'll see that, if, you know, if we're working on a, for example, if we are working on a presentation for a promotion um, where they're up, they're going to be up in front of the partners or the um, the exco and the executive committee or basically the bosses. And some of our sessions are along the lines of, I don't know why I'm on the list. Um, I'm never going to get this. Mm -hmm. If I stand up and I say, I explain my involvement in this particular um, project, then I'm going to piss off this other guy who's been taking the credit for it for months, you know, those sure. sort of things. And, and, and sometimes, so from, from the clients that I'm working with around that, very often it's around those set, those fears and the rewiring aspect, rewiring out of the fear into the possibility that's there and giving themselves permission, giving themselves the means to be the powerhouse that they've forgotten that they really are. Sure. You know? Yeah. Um, and then for others, there will be other aspects that are difficult for them as well. Um, even even the aspect around telling your story and putting yourself out there and 
telling people how good you are, telling people what you're capable of, that can be very difficult for a lot of people that have been brought up in a way of um, don't be the tall poppy. If you, you know, chaps don't talk about things like that. It should be enough that I've done a good job. I don't need to tell anyone. So what I find is that um, the, the people who've read the book have told me that there are chapters of it that they have spent more time on and other chapters where they just kind of read through and said, yeah, okay, fair enough, and then moved on. Right. And I think that's, I've, I've tried to write it as well in a way that you can dip in and you can you can meet, the book meets you exactly where you are. Right. And if you open the, if you open the book wherever, wherever you want within it, you'll find something that can be helpful. Sure. Um, yeah, it's great. So, so who, who's your ideal reader? I mean, who do you see as your ideal reader? Um, I think, generally speaking, someone working probably in a corporate environment that is kind of juggling a lot of these things and a lot of the, um, a lot of those doubts and those feelings of, of being stuck that I don't have a choice but to work these hours and everything else. Certainly, the people, probably because. Um, the people that have been in touch with me directly are, are former colleagues who've read this and they said, oh, Joe, this is amazing. Thank you for writing this book. I've had people write to me and say, thank you for writing this book. You assuming your story allows me to assume my own. Right. And at the same time, you know, when I did the TEDx, um, the, when I did it in, in, at the French University, it was, a, it was a kind of hybrid format in that I did, a, I did my 17, 18 minute speech and then we had half an hour of Q&A. And so those were students, engineering students, and the, and the way that the French didn't know so much about the US system, but there's a lot of pressure um, at, at university. With us, we have a pressure at 18 when we do the exams. Hmm. You pass your exams, you do well at your exams, and you get selected into university. But certainly in my day, unless you really majorly messed up, you would kind of come through it. In France, it's very different that they everyone goes to university and then you get kicked out when you fail your exams. So the pressure on these on these students is phenomenal. Wow. I, I spoke to some of them that had already been through their second or third, you know, mini burnout of their studies, and to be able to have those Q and A. And I remember um, one guy in the audience saying, "What do I do if I see my friend is going through this?" Mm. And I gave him you know, my thoughts on, you know, be there, listen, and, and just be there and see, you know, he will tell you what he needs. But I came away thinking if one guy on this campus, in this world, got some help because his friend came and listened to me talk, then that's, you know, my job is done. So all that to say that even if I wrote it for my former colleagues, for me a number of years ago, that I wish I'd had this book 10 years ago, yeah. What I'm seeing is that so many other people, it's resonating with so many other people in different um, environments and different um, different perspectives. I think the fundamental premise of the of the book is common to everyone. Hmm. I would agree with that. Yeah, I would agree. So tell us a little bit more about your business. So you said you work with corporate female leaders. Is that right? And I know that you are a speaker's coach as That's well. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, so really, um, I'm an executive and a public speaking coach. So what I do is I work with my clients to help them step into that, um, into that powerhouse that they they really are, but with very tangible skills. So what I mean by that is, I help them reframe some of those stories that they're doing by mm -hmm. by identifying them and reframing them. But then afterwards, I say, well, it's not enough just to start believing a different story you have to actually put it into practice right so for example if i'm working with someone and we're working on that promotion speech it's all very well me saying to them uh, or helping them reframe a story where they don't believe that they can tell people how good they are it's like okay well then how do we do this speech and how do we build that in a way that's going to resonate with the audience and we'll actually sure. then talk about it. so i, I kind of i i draw on you know 18 years working in corporate you know many of those the majority of those kind of client facing i draw on the experience i have of knowing what it's like to work in corporate in terms of the internal politics in terms of client facing aspects um in terms of managing a team and and help look to help them work on those very concrete skills that they can then just 
get on with it. Pretty much go walk into any room, any meeting, and know they're going to nail it. Be sure. that a meeting with their team, a meeting with their boss, um, a promotion, a conference, or whatever else. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. Yeah, you, you, there was a story, I think it was towards the tail end of the book, where you mentioned that you gave some feedback. You were offering help to someone, and they kind of rebuffed it. And then you recognize the fact that, oh, he doesn't know my background. He doesn't yeah, know my absolutely. interests, right? So that's an interesting way of looking at that because I always blamed that on a lack of rapport. So anytime that's happened in my life, I'd always say, well, no wonder I don't have any rapport with that person just yet. But I like what you're suggesting, which is they don't know your story. Yeah. You didn't share your story with them. They don't know your background. They don't know what value you can bring to the table or what you've already brought to the table, right? So I think that's a very powerful lesson, at least that I took away. Yes, and what I find really interesting in recounting the story was this kind of aha of I'd kind of gone in thinking it would be too arrogant to say, well, actually, you know, you know, I've been a conference speaker for 20 years. I actually know what it's like to be on stage in front of clients. And I, you know, I, I have worked in that client facing role. So I thought there was going to be an arrogance if I kind of spelt it out as if to say, who does she think she is? And yet to then assume that he would know without me telling him, I'm thinking, well, that's even more arrogant, you know? <laughs> it's like telepathy is one thing, but um, so yeah, I, very much so. I mean, I think it's, and and what I kind of realized is that around things like that as well, um, I'm not someone, when it comes to self-marketing, I hate being out there saying, look at me, look at me, I'm amazing. That makes me feel super, super uncomfortable. So I have to balance that with the aspect of, yeah, but I've got a book to sell and I'm, you know, I'm, right. I'm running a business. So how do you do that? And and I would I would spend time kind of, you know, the way that you kind of you get connected to people on LinkedIn or Facebook seems like a good idea at the time. But then they're so active on the social media that every time they, a post pops up, you're thinking, oh, for God's sake, what, what rubbish are they going to come up with this time? Yeah. So I'd be looking at these people and thinking, I don't want to do marketing like that. That's not what I want to do. And I had got, I almost believed that that must be the only way to do marketing. And a great piece of advice that someone gave me was, well, rather than look at them as examples of what you don't want to be, well, then look at the people that you do want to be. Sure. You know, how do they market? And what are they doing that's different? And, and, uh, and so, yeah, so it's that kind of element of, and I think this is what is, it's very important as well. Reframing these stories, reframing these choices. It's not about a cook, you know, a, um, a cookie cutter, one size fits all. It's about stepping into something that feels real and feels doable. Um, and so that's why this this kind of second part to the exercise of like, well, how do you do that? How do you step into that new story yeah. becomes so important because it's not for me to tell you how to do your self marketing, but it's about us to have a conversation and so that you can find your way um, that that feels right to you. Right. Yeah. And I found when it comes to self-marketing and I love what you just suggested, you were told, which was, you know, find the people who, you know, you, you do like their strategy, their style, their approach, whatever it is. I'm always attracted to those people. And I try to do this myself because I don't think anyone else, I don't think anyone likes to brag really. I mean, some people do, <laughs> right. But I would say the vast majority of us are wired similarly in that, you know, we don't maybe love the spotlight. We don't love all the attention. Mm -hmm. A lot of us are more introverted than extroverted. But I've seen people do a very, uh, I would say, in good taste marketing where they frame what they're talking about with gratitude or, or appreciation. Like, oh, I'm so blessed I just hit the New York Times bestseller list, you know, or I'm so grateful for all of you for participating because I just hit the New York Times, you know, without you, it would have never been possible versus look at me. I did this, I did this, sure. I did this. And now I, you know, I made it and it was all me. So I always try to frame those types mm -hmm. of, you know, what may otherwise be brags. I try to frame those with gratitude and I, and I feel better taking that approach. It feels real. It feels authentic. It needs to be sincere. Right. And I think, I think therein lies the, the key is the sincerity mm -hmm. because I think you can also tell when someone's like, Oh, I'm so grateful for all of you. And then when you know that it's just a line, but I think the sincerity right. is what makes it work. And, and you and, can't fake that. 
you know, that's, you what, that's what I love about the genuineness or the sincerity yeah. factor is like, that's really hard. You can see right through it when it's fake, when it's fraudulent, right? Very much so, very much so when it's kind of photoshopped and everything else that goes with right. it. And, and what I talk about in the book in terms of, of that as well is also positioning it for in other situations. I mean, talking about getting on a bestseller list, that's a very distinct one. But when you're, for example, when you are, um, maybe when you're meeting a client for the first time or talking about your achievements, what I talk about within the book is about putting yourself in their shoes and talking about it through their eyes. So right. these are the things that I've done or, or whatever, and this is how it helps you. And so it's it, you're then also recognizing their value and what they're looking for, and then you're bringing it in that respect. So it becomes a win for them yes. rather than brag about you. If you see what I mean. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So I'm, I'm curious, do you have time for one more question? Of course. Of I know course. you're in, where, where are you in? Is it Belfast? I'm in Belfast. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it's five o'clock roughly. Oh, no, no. It's three o'clock. Oh, it's, it's three o'clock. Okay. It's three cool. o'clock. Cool. All right. So I'm you very make... confused. You know, the, the, the life of an international author, what can I say? Time zones, getting, <laughs> getting confused. Don't know. Right? Don't know which, what day of the week it is. Yeah, I, I recently moved from Chicago to Dallas, and it's funny because I still keep touch, right, with my network, with my family, everybody in Chicago. They're always like, "Well, what what time? What time is it down there?" I'm like, "It's all Central Time, Chicago Time, same time, you know." But it keeps confusing people, you know. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I went, it's I, noon. I, what time is that there? And it's like it's noon. We're just yeah. we're all here on the. Central. We're all here. <laughs> well, I, I took my mom to California to the 2016 Emerging Women Conference. And so obviously eight hour difference with the UK and every morning we would talk to my dad. Um, so for him, it was the end of the day and every morning without fail, he'd say, well, how was your day? And every morning without fail, we'd say, well, it's just the morning. We haven't had our day right. yet. Yeah. Um, and it, yeah, it was just mind blowing. For, but anyway, yes. Yeah. It, it is an adjustment for everybody. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so you mentioned this in the book. You mentioned it a, a few moments ago. This thing we call unconscious bias. Can you explain a little bit about that and maybe share uh, an experience of your own as it relates to your own unconscious bias? Sure. Well, in terms of in, in terms of the words themselves, so the idea of bias is um, how would I explain this? I suppose the idea of bias is the idea of coming to the table with particular baggage, which tells you that someone you're speaking to, um, you maybe start off on a on a different footing with that person. So, for example, we all know about kind of conscious discrimination over here. Um, for example, in Northern Ireland. There was, a whole, there's a whole bunch of legislation around conscious, um, against conscious bias or discrimination according to your religion. So there, we all know about the kind of consciously, we don't want to consciously discriminate against someone because of their religion, their race, their gender, their sexual orientation, etc. The unconscious aspect is when we do this, not consciously, but unconsciously, we don't know we're doing it. Um, so the example I, I alluded to before, I, um, I alluded to an unconscious bias against girls with big hair. So what do I mean by that? What I realized is that when I would see um, girls or women with big hair, I had this unconscious bias in my head of, you have clearly spent far too long in the bathroom in the morning getting your hair looking like that. You've spent no time studying, so what can you teach me? And I know this came from school. You know, I know at school I was the nerd with the geeky glasses and the big perm, and the popular girls were, you know, I was top of the class. The popular girls with the big hair were not necessarily top of the class. And I find myself having, you know, having that thought that as soon as I saw someone, um, I would be like, well, what do they have to offer me? And it, I was only confronted with it with one of these um, emerging women conferences that I've spoken about a couple of times when you've got 500 women in the room with big <laughs> hair. And on stage, they've got big hair, immaculate makeup. It's like a poison um, concert. 
<laughs> Sorry? <laughs> the poison concert, right? Yeah. <laughs> They're everywhere. You can't turn around, but you've got somebody with big hair and not a stupid woman in sight. And I, I just had this kind of aha moment of, holy crap, right? You know, I'm kind of looking at that and thinking, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at these images thinking, almost thinking it's impossible to be smart and well turned out. And you kind of see that. So there's, there are a lot of resources that I um, refer to in the book where you can actually go and do tests online. So one of the tests I did, I, I discovered that I have an unconscious bias um, based on age, hmm. which I which I find surprising because I thought, okay, okay, fine. Um, so I've always done a lot of work around empowering women and, um, you know, those aspects. So to see I had an unconscious bias about age was like, um, I had no idea. Hmm. And the types of things that we're finding there is that when someone would say, when is middle age? I'm 47 years old. And a couple of years ago, I watched, do you know the movie Shirley Valentine? Does that ring a bell? I haven't seen okay. it. I know of so it. Shirley, so it, it's a movie, it was made in the 80s about this woman living in um, in Liverpool, she was a housewife, she was 43 years old, she talked to the wall. She had nothing else in her life but talking to the wall in the kitchen. So she went off to Greece to, to find herself. And I remember watching it when I was 43 years old, thinking, well, I'm not middle-aged. Um, and okay, 20 years later, the definition of middle age has changed, but what I realized was, I don't think of myself as old, I'm still kind of young, but then I, you know, when I might bump into a 21 year old, 25 year old, um, some of the people that I train, you can see that they're looking at me as like I'm some old person <laughs> and I refuse to accept it. And so this kind of translates itself out in that um, you know, I may have an unconscious bias about age and not wanting to be old and everything else. Yeah. So that's, I, I hope that, that, that explain. Yeah, is it's, that, it's a great explanation. I think a lot of us have that when it comes to age. I know for me, I still view myself as 18. Like I'm just 18. You know, my aunts and uncles are only 10, 20 years ahead of me. They're, they're, you know, I, I have aunts and uncles in my six, in their sixties and seventies, but they're still like 38, right? Aren't they still in their thirties or forties? But I still look at my, I'm almost 40 years old myself. And I still look at myself as 18 and just still trying to find my way, figure things out, do the best I can make a difference, but I don't have all the answers, you know? So I think a lot of us have that unconscious bias as it relates to our own age. Absolutely. Yeah. And then there are other people in our life that are like mirrors that remind us. Cause like my kids, I can tell how much they look up to, you know, it's like, gosh, I better at least pretend like I know what I'm doing here because they're watching me. <laughs> right. And then you have, and then you have yeah. friends who call yeah, me like absolutely. Mr. Rose. It's like, that's my dad. You know, I, I'm not Mr. Anything, you know, don't but don't even go there. Don't yeah. even go there. Cause in, in, um, in the French culture in France, there are two different words for, for you. There's a vu or there's a tu, and there's a formal version of it. And there's an informal version. And when I arrived in France, everyone was calling me the vu form because I was a manager and, or, and I'm like, no, that's my granny, you know, <laughs> and there was, I mean, just, just you wait until you get your first pair of reading glasses. Um, I had to get my first pair of reading glasses about two years ago. And I, I, I nearly had a, you know, a complete breakdown in the optician. It's like, well, he said, yes, but it happens with age. And I'm like, well, I didn't bloody well get the memo. You know, it's like, well, why, right. why does it hurt so much? And why do I have, yeah, anyway. But it, yes, I mean, it can be called unconscious about age. It can be what school you went to, whether you did go to school or whether you left school at 18 or, you know, all of those different things that we kind of walk through life. And again, part of that is the stories we tell ourselves right. you know, we've, about accents. Um, you know, if you, for example, a Northern Irish, I, I, I have lost a lot of Northern Irish accent, but a Northern Irish accent would normally come across as, Hi, now, Brian Cow. Right. And there was you know, <laughs> you know that, that sort of how are you doing? You see that you see that big car through the window, you know. Right. And, you know, the story goes that I was in the supermarket with my grandmother when I was about three or four, and apparently I shouted across the, the supermarket, Granny, Granny. <laughs> and she was mortified at my accent. So that you know, I was sent to 
learn how to speak properly and everything because even accents you can have an unconscious bias about accents and stories you tell yourself about where someone comes from or what that means about their their capacity or competence and, and those sort of things yeah i'm fascinated with this idea of truth which i think mm. is why i was so excited to read your book because i i've always believed that like truth is in the eye of the beholder you know, so like try to convince someone who believes in the truth that it's false. You can have all the evidence you want. And there's just no point. So it's just a fascinating thing because these stories we tell ourselves, it's like, I, I, what it was it the old, um, this is probably over talked about, but the old Henry Ford, I think, quote, is who said it was like, whether you believe you can or believe you can't, you're right. So it's like, it's such a powerful thing, this truth. And so many of us are sh telling ourselves these stories in this inner, you mentioned the inner critic, the inside talk, and yeah. that literally creates our destiny. I think right? you're right. And I think there's also a distinction between, um, and my dad, um, my dad talks about this a lot, um, the difference between truth and fact. Mm. You know, um, the fact is this is a black biro, but the truth is it allows me to write I mean, I know that's a silly example, but it's that kind of element of the fact is um, I did some work from, um, I gave some work to my boss and he, it came back covered in red. That is a statement of fact. I have a piece of paper that has red marks on it. But the truth is how I interpret that. Right. You know, one truth is he's an asshole. Everything I do, he hates and he just writes it all over the place. And there goes my clean lyrics. Um you know, badge on my podcast. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm <just kidding. laughs> oh my god, it was about to happen. <laughs> oh my god. So he's a not very nice person. Um, or another <laughs> truth is, I didn't fully understand what he was asking for, and therefore I didn't fulfill what he was looking for. Next time, I need to work out how to understand his expectations and do it differently. Sure. Yeah. I can't believe it got into 51 minutes. I know, right? And I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't cuss at all. And then just at that moment, you've lost your badge of honor. I'm so sorry. That's amazing. The fact that you're Irish and you hadn't cussed for 51 <laughs> minutes is amazing. Speaking <laughs> of unconscious bias. Oh, my gosh. I have to say that my... my um, my, I'm very Irish, so my, hopefully you don't take offense to that. <laughs> oh, my God. No, don't worry at all. No, it's, it, it makes me laugh because I, I, um, I, I did a kind of mini podcast interview at some point and my parents had watched it and they thought it was lovely you know you spoke very well and a nice rhythm but you know you swore within 30 seconds of the podcast <laughs> you'll have lost all the presbyterians when you did that <laughs> like, oh my goodness that's awesome <laughs> oh i'm never going to be invited back to any podcast at right? all. Oh, that's hilarious that's awesome um, all right well mm -hmm. joanna where can we find you if we wanted to learn more about what you do uh, the, the coaching you do, the work you do, your book, where can we find you? Well, come onto my website. It's um, joannadenton.com. Uh, so J-O-A-N-N-A-D-E-N-T-O-N.com. Got all the details of what I do. My, te my TED talks, are up, my TEDx talks are up there. Um, the book details are in there and kind of getting in touch. Cool. And yeah. Cool. And if anyone's kind of read... If, I, if anyone's been listening, those people listening, if they want to send me an email, say they've listened to me on the podcast and, and um, get in touch like that, then that would be great. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today. This is a You're lot very of fun. Welcome. If You're there very were, welcome. If there's one message or one thing you could bestow upon us today, what would that be? I would think it would have to be say about choice. There is always a choice. Choices have consequences, but there is always a choice. Don't forget that even in those moments where you believe that there is no choice but to take a particular action um, that's expected of you, and so you don't choose, even the fact of not choosing is a choice itself. So how can you unpack some of those stories that you tell um, that give rise to those that feeling of stuck and that you don't have a choice and start to make different choices? so that you, your future is there to be written for you whenever you want it. So what future are you going to choose for yourself today? I love that. I love that. Well, thanks again. I can't wait to go through your book uh, a second time and go through some of those journaling exercises. I'm looking forward to that. So thank you again for writing it and thanks for being on the show. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me on the show.
Thank you. All right, Sean here again. Thanks so much for joining us this week. Say, if you like what you saw today, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel so that you can catch future episodes. Take care and make it a great day.